Welcome to the second session in our exercise series in our type 1 diabetes program. And in this session, we are looking at the dietary management of exercise to prevent those low glucose levels occurring and also what you should be doing around certain glucose levels pre and post exercise. So keep in mind that there's more to come after this with regards to insulin management because there's several different ways you can do this in terms of preventing hypos and preventing highs. Um, so we're just going to take it one block at a time and then at the end we're going to put it all together so you can understand uh, the various different ways that we can approach this. Now, I've written out here on the board the general advice regarding this. Again, this is in your plan that you can download in the members area. So we have a nice algorithm, which I'd encourage you to take a picture of so you have it to hand so you're never caught out with this stuff, particularly if you're a keen exerciser. Now, obviously, with all the effects of exercise, there will be um, a big dependence on how intensely that you work and also the duration of the exercise. Someone who goes for a walk at a very slow pace compared to someone that goes for a jog in the same um, time frame, but really pushes themselves, they're gonna have very, they're gonna have two very different effects. Um, and I see it all the time just with regards to my own training and exercise. You know, me and my friend, we might do exactly the same session, but one of us might work a lot harder than the other. Typically speaking, usually them working a lot harder than me. But obviously, if we had diabetes, that would have knock-on effects of our glucose levels and how we might need to manage it. So one of the take-home messages of all of this is make sure that you are testing regularly, tracking the patterns and understanding your own patterns, because although we have general principles with this, obviously it's dependent on what you're doing day to day, how intensely you're working, how long you're doing it, how often you're repeating it. And so understanding your own patterns is crucial. Anyway, so let's talk about the dietary implications, all right? So we have three periods with regards to exercise where we are going to have to take stock of where we're at. So the first is pre-exercise. So we already know that all exercise, regardless of whether it's cardio or high intensity, in the long term will have knock-on effects with regards to dropping into hypo land. But this can also be particularly pronounced during cardio sessions um, where you're just in a steady state situation or exercise intensity and the general trend of your glucose levels is going to be down. So if you're coming into the session with a low glucose level, say below five millimoles per litre, you're probably going to want to eat something quite quick acting to counteract that, uh, although it's not technically a hypo, lower of the scale glucose level, okay? So we'd recommend taking on board somewhere between 15 and 20 grams of carbohydrate, which is your typical hypo treatment. So four or five gluco um, tablets or Lucozade tablets or dextrose tablets, um, 150 ml of juice, uh, what else? Little bag of Haribo will do the job or bag of sweets, just to tip it up into a safer zone before you get going. If the glucose levels are only between 5.1 and 7.9, we also recommend just following the same advice as above. If you find yourself between eight and 10, that's the sweet spot, big tick, carry on, but also make sure that you're testing about 45 minutes into the session just to take stock of where you're at so you're not slipping into a hypo because obviously if you're hot, you're sweaty um, and you're distracted, a lot of the effects of exercise can also be very similar to the effects of a hypo in terms of your heart beating, getting sweaty, um, getting a bit tingly, I know <laughs> tingly, maybe for some people, maybe not for everyone, but nonetheless, the hypo symptoms might be masked. If you're a little higher than this, 10.1 to 13.9, we suggest just monitoring, but you don't have to do anything, just keep on top of it. But if you're going into the session with a high glucose level, over 14, first things first, we want you to test your ketones. So we have talked about ketones and sick day rules in a previous video. Um, so if you wanna re-engage with that, just go check it out. But if your ketones are a low level, so they are below one, then you don't need to do anything, but we'd suggest avoiding high intensity exercise because obviously if you have a high glucose level already and you do high intensity exercise, it can push it up even further. And that's when you might just find actually you're having a problem. If you do have ketones, 
if they are at a medium level, then you might wanna take a correction dose, maybe around 30% of your usual dose, and then just wait a little bit to see if the ketones subside, and then start the session, but again, avoid that high intensity, um, high intensity type of exercise. But if you're having high levels of ketone, particularly if they're above two or three, I would say, even maybe 1.5 for some people, maybe consider aborting the session and actually just trying to manage those ketones, get them down, make sure you're being hydrated, taking regular correction doses um, and getting on top of it. If they continue to climb, then it might show that something's in balance or something's wrong, or perhaps you're fighting a certain illness that you're not aware of yet. And if in doubt, always, always, always uh, just give um, the emergency services a call or straight to A&E if the ketones are getting out of control. So that's before exercise. Now, obviously, if you're satisfied that you're in the good zone and you've not got significant ketones, to be fair, I'd probably say above 1.5 would be enough for me to not do the exercise session. So anything above that, maybe consider not exercising. Now, during exercise, you got a bit more flexibility with regards to the glucose levels, um, but we kind of use the rule of eight. So if you're below eight, then you might wanna just fuel your session a little bit more. So you take 15 to 20 grams of carbohydrates again, without taking any insulin, I should stress, um, just to prop yourself up a little bit, particularly if you're doing cardio exercise. This is where things like sports drinks can come quite in handy because a few sips and you've managed to get that carbohydrate hit. No one really wants to be eating sweets and chewing um, tablets whilst you're doing exercise because your mouth can be quite dry. Um, also, glucogels and things that runners will use or endurance athletes will use can also have a place here. If you're between 8 and 14, again, you're in the, you're in the good zone. Um, above 14, then again, make sure that you stop in testing, maybe even do a ketone check. You'll know your own level if you're, if, you know, if you're doing sessions and you're regularly going above 14 and you're constantly checking ketones and you're never becoming ketotic, you'll know for you that that's not a ketone generating um, point for you unless something else is off, all right? So you'll know your own patterns as time goes by. But just be, you know, if it does go towards more the 14 end of the scale, we know it's gonna drop off after the session later, so it will self-correct itself in time, so just be patient. So don't feel like you have to leave the session and then suddenly throw in a normal correction dose because you'll have two things working. You'll have the exercise and your insulin. And as we know from the first session in this series, um, that's putting you on for a hypo later. And then looking at after exercise. So again, we've got two things we can do here. We can reduce the insulin later and we can also eat. Now this is gonna have, um, the exercise is obviously gonna have effects later in the day. So if you have a meal planned within two hours of finishing, then just eat the meal. And we know that to replenish the glucose stores in your body, the optimal way, ideally you mix carbohydrate with protein, which most of us do at meals anyway, and aiming for roughly three or four grams of carbohydrates for one gram of protein. And of course, as you're exercising and those hormones are being released and your body's dialing down its, well, usually would be dialing down its own insulin supply, your body is releasing glycogen from its stored format in the liver um, and in the muscles, breaking it down into glucose and burning up that fuel. So if you're not eating and replenishing that fuel, the next time you exercise, you've got less reserves in the body to help you fuel that exercise. So essentially what happens is you're more likely to have a hypo on the second or third session um, than the first session if you're not replenishing your stores. So it's really important to get those carbohydrates back in. If you haven't got a meal planned in the next two hours, then again, it's that simple rule of 15 to 20 grams of carbohydrate or snacks to keep you tied over until you have the meal. And of course, you'll also need to think about that EPOC effect. So you're probably gonna need to reduce your rapid acting insulin at the next meal. If you're using a pump, then you might have dialed down your basal or background insulin during the session. You may wanna wait a little bit before you increase it back up and also still consider a rapid insulin reduction at your next meal. Again, you'll know your patterns as time goes by. Now for the endurance athletes amongst us, there are some other specific considerations we need to think about because when you're an endurance athlete or you're doing long distance events, then whether you have diabetes or not, you are fighting a losing battle about keeping up your energy. 
you will always burn more energy in those types of events than you will be able to take on board. Now, usually that just results in people hitting the wall, feeling a bit lousy, and essentially fighting the uphill battle to get enough nutrition in them to continue to fuel them. But ultimately that's where the training comes in prior to the event to help them maximize those bodily systems to get the best out of their performance. In diabetes, however, it becomes slightly problematic because if you can't physically keep up your glucose levels, you're on for a hypo, and that's really gonna end the session for you more than likely. Now, the problem is what happens um, in general exercise is because the blood is shunted away from your gastrointestinal tract, there's only a certain amount of carbohydrate your body can absorb without causing serious gastro, gastrointestinal distress. And that upper limit is about 90 grams per hour. If you exceed that without being too graphic, it gets messy. Okay, and you hear horror stories of athletes who do exceed that and they have to abort the session or the event because they've really suffered. Um, but obviously if you're training quite hard or you're doing a particular event that is burning up more than 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour, and that's assuming you can even tolerate 90 grams, your tolerance level might be 60, 70, 80, then trying to think about how you're going to manage that is a really important component. And it might be that you have to go into the session a little bit higher than what you'd like to, to give you a bit of comfort and a bit of margin before that drop happens. Um, as a rule, we'd say anywhere between 20 and 60 grams of carbohydrate during prolonged uh, steady state exercise or cardio session tends to keep you well um, placed throughout that session. Start with only 15 to 20 grams at first, but if you know you're pushing it harder than your average exerciser, or you're getting on the treadmill or going for a run and you're quite good at it and you're gonna pound the pace, then you might need to be up more towards that 60 grams per hour, um, which again, the gels, tablets, and sports drinks can really be an ally during those types of events. The last thing I just wanted to talk about as well is hypos. So obviously we talked about what happens if you're generally in target, but if you've had a hypo, what we want you to do is correct the hypo as you normally would, wait 45 minutes, then do exercise. And so then these rules apply, but just make sure you're being militant with testing your glucose levels um, and make sure that you've got fuel there and carbohydrates to keep you topped up if you need them because if you had a hypo you're more likely to have a hypo again and the reason the hypos occurred is because you've got too much insulin in your system and if there's too much insulin in the system there's probably still active insulin in your body which is going to exacerbate any future hypos particularly if you start to exercise if you've had a hypo that's required any third party assistance or you've had a severe hypo generally below three millimoles per liter don't exercise uh, for 24 hours make sure you treat it and uh, just chill out. I know it can be frustrating and it's one of the consequences of having type one diabetes, but it's more important to be safe. And if you've had a severe hypo, you're much more likely to have another severe hypo within that 24 hour period. So if you're putting things like exercise in on top of that, you're really setting yourself up for problems. Um, not everyone of course will have a hypo guaranteed, but we're in the risk game and we really don't wanna be taken or I don't want you to take that risk. Uh, um, so just be sensible with it. You can always make up the session tomorrow uh, and keep yourself safe in the meantime. Okay guys, so that's quite a lot of information. So we're gonna be building on that. The next session we're gonna look at how to adjust your insulin around exercise. Uh, this is one type of management, insulin's another type of management. At the end you'll see that we can tie it all together and actually a combination of both is probably best. So we'll leave it there for now and I'll see you at the next session.